by the way, if you didn't get through all of this, um, the good news is that this prayer shows up a lot in Jewish <laughs> liturgy. So now you have something to read um, while that's happening. Um, the, let's, a lot of people just asked about the timing and the dating of these texts. Um, so we'll just take a look at that for one second before we get into some of the surprising differences between the texts that you're going to tell me about. Turn to page 9 of this source sheet here. Um, to give credit where credit is due, uh, actually, someone was asking if I typed in the, the, the text of the Amida from the Gamines. I know it's from a source sheet of, uh, from Victor Shinan, who's a professor uh, of liturgy and Midrash in the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Um, so thanks to him for typing it in. And, uh, and this is a, uh, a schematic that was originally done um, uh, by Joseph Heinemann, who was a, sort of the dean of Jewish liturgy in the middle of the 20th century, also at the Hebrew University. So what you have here on this figure is sort of the boxes of Jewish liturgy. And if you start at the bottom, where it says Svarad, Yemen, Romania, Ashkenaz, and Roma, those are the modern liturgies that, that we, basically the entire modern Jewish world is, is essentially covered in those five liturgies. Plus you see the Hasidic Nusach Svarad. This is what's, what's um, complicated is when you go to a, uh, a place that uses Nusach Svarad, that's really a Hasidic um, liturgy that's a combination of Sfaradi Tahor and Ashkenaz. So, um, so if you ever go to the Karlbach Shul or, or something else that uses Nusach Sfarad, um, you're actually using a combination of what, what is Sfaradi and Ashkenazi. But not to be um, Ashkenazi normative here, when I say modern Jews, I'm thinking of those Jews in Yemen and in Morocco, all of them, all of us, the Germans, you put it, Russians, everybody, we're all tracing, in this schema, you can see it, a solid line traces back to the top box on the left, the Babylonian rite, the Bavel, uh, Sidor tradition. Um, and the Palestinian rite, the Eretz Israel rite, it basically is lost to history. You have these little broken dotted lines which flow into our modern contemporary liturgies, but they're, it's, it's just an influence. It's not an actual um, hard line, uh, continuous flow. Um, and, and you see that played out in this Amida as well. So for instance, and, and just to be clear, the Babylonian rite, um, what I will refer to as, as, as Bavel, uh, or, or um, to be more specific, the Ashkenaz, uh, the Ashkenazi rite that we look at um, on, on the, uh, which side of the column is it? On the, the one with the Nikida, on the right-hand side of the column of what you were looking at. That's Bavel, and the other one is Eretz Yitzrael, um, okay? And so when you see this dotted line, you can point out to some of the dotted line influences that Eretz Israel has on our Nusach, but they're not a lot, right? They're two distinct liturgies, okay? Um, and the timing of this is complicated. Everything from the Geniza is hard to date, uh, unless you actually have some dated. The Geniza is great, because it was like, I'm tossing in you know, the Hebrew version of, of Ben Sira, and I'm also tossing in my receipt from Rite Aid. Like the whole thing gets thrown in there. The receipt from Rite Aid has a date on it, you know. You have like a whole book that was written on two both that were put in the Geniza. Um, but a lot of things obviously don't have a date on them, including the, uh, most of the texts of the Amidah. There was an Eretz Yisrael, uh, a synagogue, as I mentioned, Old Cairo, that, that said the Eretz Yisrael Nusaf all the way through the time of the Rambam in the 12th century. So this might have been people who were davening in that shul in, in, old, in old Cairo, or a traveler who came from Eretz Yisrael, or any number of ways. We don't know how these texts got in there always. Um, there is no way to tell, oh yes, the Eretz Israel one is older and the Bavel one is later. Um, scholars used to think that that was sort of, we gave preference to Eretz Israel as older. Now that's all been sort of thrown into question. So it's very hard to date these and very hard to say which came first. But clearly, there's some, some influence one to the other and some knowledge one to the other. I mean, as, as different as they are, the overlap is actually quite significant. Um, so um, just to turn over to, to one, one other thing before we start the, uh, the examination inside, turn over to page 10. Um, page 10 is a copy of one of the, the chapters of Ben Sira in Hebrew. This is the, the, the page, not this particular page, but this is from the book that tipped Schechter off to the fact that this Geniza was so significant, the first Hebrew copy of the book of Ben Sira, in which you said, well, there's some people who said, ben, the Hebrew copy of Ben Sira, I can't believe this is where it was found. And some people were like, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, for those in the second category, um, the part of the reason that Ben Sira is significant 
it gets to the question of when the Amida was written. And Sira um, uh, was written, as I said, in the second century BCE. So while the temple, the temple is still in operation, um, and Ben Sira was written down. And if you look at this psalm, um, you'll see that it sort of mirrors our Psalm 136 in its structure. Um, you know, Hodu Lex, Kilo Lam Kasto. Um, but the things that we're giving thanks for are different. And what you'll notice is the, um, the things that we're giving th thanks for mirror some of the chatimot, some of the endings of the Amida blessings that we know of. So you start with Hodu Le Goel Yisrael, in you know, the fifth line down. Hodu Le Mekabet Sincha Yisrael. Hodu le bone iro mitasho, which is like bone yushalayim. Hodu le matzniach karen le beit david, matzniach karen yeshua. Hodu, skipping a line, hodu le magen avraham. So you see some of the endings of the Amida, which is actually the most constant part of what we see between Eretz Israel and, and Babel, was already floating around as a liturgical unit, um, you know, 300 years before Rabban Gamliel was, uh, was saying, you know, let's make an Amida here in post rabbinic Judaism. So you have this whole debate. You know, we were often taught, well, we had sacrifices, then the temple was destroyed, we had to replace it with something. I know, right? Tfila is instead of um, korbanot, and that's why we invented the, the Amida. But here you see, and thanks to the Geniza, we can see clearly parts of the Amida as a text preceded the destruction of the temple. Even if the Amida as a liturgical um, unit didn't necessarily uh, formulate there. So it's, it's unlikely that somebody just sat down one day and said, you know, gosh, the temple's destroyed. Just give me like, it's, I'm, like a half an hour. I'm going to just whip this out for you, which is kind of how the story in the Babli works, you know, where Shimon Apakuli just sort of whips out the Amida. Um, and the only thing that seems to be missing is uh, the Birkat Aminim, which is filled in. Anyways, that doesn't seem to be exactly what happened there. But um, that's a story for another year. Um, OK, so now let's actually turn to the. Um, to the text themselves. And you'll tell me what are some of the surprising differences, either that um, that the uh, uh, that's surprising in the Eretz Yisrael Nusach, or in light of looking at Eretz Yisrael, it's, it's now surprising in the Nusach that we might be familiar with. So, so let's just start on page three, if there were any surprising, interesting, worthy of saying. Yeah, Gabe. In the first bracha, the Amidah, I guess, in the third box, um, it se the Eretz Yisrael Nusach seems to be more personal. It has, in the part where it's different, it has more in the first person of Madhineinu uh, Nusachinu as opposed to the third person. Uh -huh, and give me the example of the, of the third person in, in our Nusach, uh, on the right hand side. Okay. Good. So you have some, you know, there's Magineinu and Mivtachenu. The Enu, the hour ending, is a little more prominent, let's say, in the Eretz Yisrael Nusach. Although you still have the Magen Avotenu in Eretz Yisrael, um, which is sort of parallel to Zocher Chasei Avot. What are some of the other differences in, in that in that bracha between Eretz Yisrael and, uh, yeah? Well, Remind me your name again, sorry. Matthew. Matthew, thank you. Well, in our version, we know that we always get this part of like the Sheva part of the Amidah, whereas the Eretz Yisrael version, you already have sort of a request coming. In the Eretz Israel, you have requests. Right. Or the next line, Loya Boshe Lelam Kovecha. Good. Okay. So interesting. Um, the question of this, the schema of the Amida is, um, right, it's um, let's praise, let's ask, and let's thank. Right? That's sort of the, the Rambam actually uh, boiled that down as a theory of the Amida. Um, praise, you know, you butter, butter God up, you throw in your, you know, laundry list of stuff, and you thank God for the press that he gives you. Um, but it's not exactly that clear, because you can already find in the stuff that's in the thanking stuff, I'm thanking God, I'm asking God to, for God to rebuild the temple, right? Um, or I'm, I'm praising God in the beginning, but I say, who may be goel leave neven ahem. Right? Who brings a redeemer to his? Is that a, is that praise? Am I praising God for bringing a redeemer to his children's children? I'm kind of asking for that because it didn't quite happen yet, right? Um, so there's this whole schema that seems to be break, broken down. Although um, you're pointing to some interesting uh, sort of overall theme there. What, what's some of the local textual differences there? Yeah, Shira. Okay, good. The chesed and, and the rachamim is clearly now highlighted 
in our version because it's missing in the Eretz Yisrael version, right? Um, the whole chesed, uh, the, the, you have, just to be clear, it, we say, this is five lines down in, the, uh, in box three. Um, you say, El Elyon, Gomel Chasadim Tovim, that's chesed number one, Bikone Ako, Bizocher Chaste Avot. So you have these two chesed here that don't appear on, on the left hand side. And if you look at the next box down, you also have a lack of chesed in the Eretz Yisrael version, and the chesed shows up in, in our version as well. And if you look at the one in Eretz Yisrael, it makes it clearer what our version possibly might have been originally. Here's what I mean. In our version, we say, Michakel chayim bechesed, mechayim etim berachamim rabim, right? Who, um, you know, who sustains life with loving kindness, who revives the dead with great mercy. And then we have a series of verb and object. Somech noflim rofei cholim matir asurim, right? Um, you know, who, who raises up the fallen, who heals the sick, who releases the captive. But if you take out the chesed and the rachamim, you actually have a very clear literary uh, device here, which is <laughs> verb object, right? So just read it. It's mechakel chayim, mechayei metim, somech noflim rofei cholim matir asurim. Now you start to see what the original sort of literary device was and how chesed sort of jumped in there as in it's looking like some sort of addition out of place. And you can see that in the Eretz Yisrael version here as well, which is to say we have mikayem meitim, mashiv haruach, morid hagashem. Those are also verb objects. Mechakel chayim, mechayem meitim. And then you have the end uh, pasuk there. So um, chesed stands out here. And what's even crazier is that the chesed in our thing actually interrupts what is a pasuk in the other, in the Eretz Yisrael version. Which is to say, in our version, we say, El Elyon, Gomel Chasadim Tovim, Bikone Yaakov. Now look on the other side version, the Eretz Yisrael version, we have El Elyon, Kone Shamaim Va'aretz. So you have to just notice what's going on here, which is to say, um, uh, oh, that's bad. <laughs> okay. Uh, El Elyon, and then we have, and then we have in the Eretz Yisrael version, El Elyon, Kone, Shamayim, Ba'aretz. So you have Kone and Kone. These are the same. These are the same. Move in a second. This is just missing here. This is the Chesed. And then Hakol, which is basically the same as Shamayim Ba'aretz. When I say heaven and earth. You know, it's it's in, it's in a, an inclusion. It's everything. Heaven, heaven, the uppermost, earth, the lowermost, everything in between. That's the same as Hakol. Now, what's crazy is El Elyon Kone Shamayim Ba'aretz is a pasuk. Where's the pasuk from? Breshid. From Breshid, from Perik Yudalat of Breshid, from the 14th chapter of Genesis. And basically, um, and and who's speaking? Who says that? So Malkit Tzedek is the one who is the original uh, uh, um, person who says, El Elyon Kone Shamayim Ba'aretz, says, says to Avram, Baruch Avram Le'el Elyon Kone Shamayim Ba'aretz. This is after Avram wins this war of the five kings versus the four kings, and he's about to refuse the spoils of war from the king of Sodom. And Malki Tzedek appears stage left out of nowhere and offers Avram bread and wine and says, Baruch Avram Le'el Elyon Kone Shamayim Ba'aretz. Um, so this is a blessing of Malki Tzedek. And then later in that same parak, Avram uses that and says basically as an oath that he's not going to take any spoils of war from the king of Sodom because the king of Sodom is not somebody you want to be benefiting from. Things don't end well for that guy. Um, is that he says Baruch? Uh, he, th he takes a an oath, and the oath is El Ayon Kanesh Amayim Va'aretz, preceded by one word Yud Hey Vav. So Avram takes a, an oath to Adonai El Ayon Kanesh Amayim Va'aretz that I'm not taking anything from the king of Sodom. But the bottom line thing to notice here is that which is in Eretz Yisrael, is missing in our Babel thing and is a, is a sort of interrupted verse and a rewritten verse. So now I have to ask you, which do you prefer? What's the more, what's, what's, what, has, what has what going for it? Ah, okay, so so one thing is that Malki Tzedek, you know, we, what was Malki Tzedek, he was a, uh, we don't know what he did, but he was a Kohen Le'el Elyon. 
right? He was a priest to Elion, and whatever that, whichever particular denomination that was, it was not Jewish, because the, the population survey in those days was very quick. Um, <laughs> so, so El Elion, Kanech Amayim Ba'aretz, if you're a priest to El Elion, uh, maybe we don't want your words in the Amida, and we'll rewrite them. Um, another possibility, which is, which, is, uh, which is an interesting take, was actually by a scholar, a scholar in Cambridge University who, uh, following Schechter uh, in the 40s, a scholar named Naftali Vider, who, who basically theorized that there is a midrash that says about, about this pasuk, El Elyon Konesh Amayim Ba'aretz, that is actually referring to two beings. You think El Elyon Konesh Amayim Ba'aretz, God Most High, who creator of heaven and earth, is all about God. But the midrash actually says, no, El Elyon is God, Konesh Amayim Ba'aretz is Avram. So there's some theory that, that uh, Naftali Vider put forth, which is to say that people who knew that Midrash wanted to um, uh, uh, prevent the idea that Avram, we're praying to Avram. After all, this is a bracha about Avram, right? So I'll do a little bit of rewriting of the pasuk. I'll interrupt it with some chesed. I'll rewrite the words Shammai Baritz and say Akol. And now we're, in, we're, we're skating on some, some thicker ice. Yeah. Why do we still say that on Friday night? Though? Ah. Why do we say it on Friday night? It's also First of all, where do we say it on Friday? Just spell it out. After right, after the Shemona Esrei, before my gain of vote, right, we say, you know, El Elyon Kone Shamayim Va'aretz, my gain of vote, right? So, we, so is, this didn't fall out of, of, uh, of practice. The Eretz Yisrael Pasuk um, didn't fall out of practice. And maybe uh, the reason it was preserved is, well, what's the reason that you'd want that there? It's a pasuk, right? At, at the end of the day, it's a pasuk, and yes, there might be some midrashic interpretations of it, but fundamentally, we like psukim. That's, a, that's pretty solid ground to be quoting from. But what you're noticing is that throughout the liturgy, that you know, our liturgy, um, uh, the Bavel liturgy, you have some of those dotted lines that show up from Eretz Yisrael, including on Friday night, El Ayon Konesh Amayim Yeah. Um, so about that, and also something that comes up on the Just um, say which box you're in. Sorry, I'm in the second box down on the fourth page. Um, so you're thinking, like, this Konesh Amayim Ba'aretz comes up in a, an Amida that's not, like, super rare, but definitely more rare than the one that we say all the time, every day. Um, and the Ve'en Lanu Elohami uh comes up in our, like, interrupted end of the Kedusha on Yamim Noraim, and does that point to, like, this is an older thing which gets preserved in these, like, very rare Amidas, or is it a... Uh, right, so the point that Emily is making here, which is to say that we have different types of liturgical moments during the year, and the, the moment of high holidays of, of let's say, uh, you know, Yamim Noraim is, is perhaps a, you know, a... a I don't know, more special, more rare, something that's characterologically different than your Tuesday morning Amida. Maybe that's older, maybe it's more important, and maybe that's why some of these uh, Eretz Yisrael phrases got preserved there. Just to be clear, that box on page four, Kadosh Atav and Arashemecha, the Ein Lanu Eloha, probably Baladecha, is something that we Ashkenazim uh, say on uh, high holidays. Um, the, 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 the problem is there's no answer to that. In other words, it's possible that it was older and preserved there. It's possible that people said, you know what, I want to have, I don't want to give up on this other nusach that I once heard. So I'll put it in some other place. You know, I'll say it at some other time during the year. Um, and maybe that's the reason that you see, you know, the end of the, the last bracha that you have here, um, the very last bracha on the, uh, on the series here on page seven. Um, Sim Shalom, flip over to page seven. The very end of the Amida is um, Baruch Ata Hashem on our side, on the right hand side, Hamivarech et Amo Yisrael Bashalam, who blesses his people Israel with peace. We're in peace. And on the left hand side, it's Oseh Hashalom, who makes peace. What's the fundamental difference there? Right? Oseh Hashalom is what we end the Amida with on high holidays. And the Hamivarech et Amo Yisrael Bashalom we end normally. Maybe there is no fundamental difference you know, sort of uh, on a deeper meaning, maybe it's just two formulations that we wanted to preserve, and I'm ending putting one one place in the other. Um, 
Okay, go, going back, going back to the beginning. Other things that were surprising to you, strange, unusual, made you second guess things. Yes, no. Um, maybe it's a little bit for you to actually start, but in that very first thought, Baruch Hashem, Melo Kim, Melo Kharisa, Gorol Gorol Bein. Does that imply that they set a name between? Yeah. Okay, great. So, so Noah's pointing out something, uh, something very important, which we'll look at. Page three, the very first box. The very first box. You have two ways. Just to be clear, this is the last blessing before the Amida. So, I actually started with a blessing that precedes the Amida. Now, there's a rule that says, what do you have to? How do you go into the Amida? So, Gula, let's be You have to, you have to um, adjoin the theme of Gula of redemption to tefillah, which is the rabbinic word for amida. You have to connect the geula theme, the redemption theme, to the amida. So anything that might interrupt that um, is a problem. So here you have the word amen that seems to be interrupted, uh, interrupting it, um, uh, which leads to the practice that you'll see in many modern day uh, congregations of the sort of the fade out, you know, the, the lowering of the volume, <laughs> the getting to the end of the, of the blessings before the amida. And then you present, prevented anybody from saying amen, but probably what actually happens is that no one actually says the blessing, which is then <laughs> totally horrible. And this is the whole point. So that now you have some sort of like resurgence of you know people saying it loudly, Gal Yisrael, you know, and then somebody says amen, and then everybody says, oh, we're back to square one. But you can see here that the uh, practice of saying amen is not necessarily um, from, from ignorance because it was actually showing up in a door. So let's just take a look at a text. Um, uh, no, if you just want to read, flip over to page, uh, flip over to page two. Sorry. Oh, fascinating. That, okay, good, good, good. We'll come back to that in one second. But just, just read the the uh, meaning there. So we're on page two, text number six. Should you say amen to your prayer? In taught, one who leads Shema and leads the Amidah literally passes before the ark, and leads the priestly blessing, and reads from the Torah and from the Hasarah, and one who blesses on any of the mitzvot mentioned in the Torah should not answer after himself Amen, and if he does, he is a fool. There are those who teach, he is a fool, and those who teach, he is wise. Oh, man. <laughs> Rav Hirsa said, the one who said he is wise is in a case where answers are made at the end of all the blessings. And the one who says he is a fool is in the case where he answers on each and every blessing. Okay, so there's this idea that one who leads the, sh the Shema, HaPores et Shema, or in some texts, Al Shema, which is a whole other shir about what that means. But let's say in some form, in what, how people used to say the Shema, there was some way in which the leader would lead the Shema, and people would respond. It's not actually the way we do it now. But it was something that you that you uh, that you did um, as a particular liturgical move. They're saying about that um, about that liturgical process. If you end the entire series of any of these, if you all the brachot and the haftarah, etc. If you end all of them with the word amen, you're a wise person. If you sorry, bonei bracham avi shalaim amen in, in Birkat Hamazon, which is the end of the. Oh, but there's the fourth blessing. Maybe it was later. Okay, right. But you see these things of like series of brachot, we end with amen. And so this is a series of brachot. We, we want to end it with amen. Now, interestingly, where is this source from? Ah, the Jerusalem Talmud. So this is where we start to notice that some of the differences between the Amidas are actually preserved in the differences between the Babylonian Talmud and the uh, Jerusalem Talmud, as it's, as it's called. Just to look at one other example of that before we get to... Uh, uh, to Annie's strong point about um, about where Geula shows up again, um, just tur turn over to page, sorry for the flipping, but turn over to page three again, just to look at the, the differences here in, the, in box number one. In box number one, we end, it's like, given, okay, given, I'm going to end with Geula, I'm going to end with redemption. So what's the difference between our Geula and Eretz Yisrael Geula? Okay, first of all, there's a, um, right. The whole pasuk. I mean, it's a part of a pasuk, Tzur Yisrael Vagoalo. Tzur Yisrael Vagoalo is, is part of a pasuk, and seems to be, Tzur Yisrael at least is a, sort of a, you know, a name for God, and Goalo, Goel. So you're ending with Gaal, you're ending with redemption. Um, but what's the fundamental 
uh, theological difference. If I say Ga'al Yisrael versus Goel Yisrael. Past tense versus present tense, right? So Ga'al, Ga'al Yisrael, when were we redeemed? In Egypt, as Emily said, right? Sur Yisrael the Goalo, when are we redeemed? Well, now. now, or this is like, you know, maybe Goel, who brings the Redeemer. Um, so it's possible that um, uh, there's something going on there, but just to notice how liturgy also plays out in our time, then we'll get to some, some, some comments. Um, where have you heard this phrase before? Right, so Avinu Shabbat Shalom, Sur Yisrael Vigoalo, which is the beginning of the prayer for the, the modern prayer for the state of Israel. Who wrote the modern prayer for the state of Israel? Also, oh, we don't know. <laughs> Crazy. Some say it was Shai Agnon, some say it was the. Shai Agnon said it was Shai Agnon. No, no, he never admitted it. He never admitted it. And it's, it's, it's a biography. crazy. No, but it's a, it's a crazy debate that, that uh, Tabori just published an article about it three years ago, where they basically, they still don't know if he wrote the whole thing, if he edited it, if he had some hand in it, if the chief rabbis, if it, whoever wrote it, it's crazy. You get, this is like, you know, it didn't happen before 1948. It's been in memory and history. Um, he wrote it. <laughs> so um, Gilad apparently solved that problem. So um, uh, anyways, uh, whoever wrote the prayer for the state of Israel, why are they starting off, Avinu Shama Shamai, Suri Yisrael Vigo that's what who's davening? Whoever it is. But who are those people? Eretz Israel. In other words, it's a Zionist move to start off the prayer for the state of Israel with Sor Yisrael v'go'alo. Because you're saying, you're taking a phrase from the Eretz Israel liturgy. And it's the, whole, it's the whole thing of sort of, we're not in the Babel box anymore. We're back in the, in the Eretz Israel box. And I'm going to bring that to the fore when I say and write my, uh, my prayer for the state of Israel. Um, but, but just to see how this plays out in the, in the Gemara, so turn over to page two. Um, sorry, page one, um, the very first page. Who can read box number four, Rava said? Yeah, please. Good guy. Good, okay, so Rava, who is living where? In Babylonia, right? Says for Kriyat Shema and Hallel, this is the Hallel of, of, of the Haggadah, you say Ga'al Yisrael. You say it in the past. You're talking about Egypt. But it, but it's Slota in the Amida, you say Go'el Yisrael. You say it in the present, which is what we do, right? The seventh blessing of the Amida is Go'el Yisrael, and Ga'al Yisrael we reserve for the, the, the blessing that leads into it. But that's not the only option here. So go ahead, read the next text, text number five. In Emet V'yatziv, right? You have to mention the Exodus in the stuff that follows the Shema. Rebbe says, one must mention Shemot. Others says, one must mention the story of the Sea of Sheep in the Golden Exodus. Rebbe Hashur Ben-Nevi says, one must mention all of them, and you must mention Rachel, Israel, and Judah. Right. Tzarich, Kulan, you have to mention all of those topics. Vitzarich Lomar, Tzur Yisrael V'go'alo. And you have to say Tzur Yisrael V'go'alo. Where is Rebbe Hashur Ben-Nevi living? In Eretz Yisrael. That's how he shows up in the Jerusalem Talmud. So you have already preserved in the Talmudim the differences between these two liturgies, which you might not necessarily have paid attention to until they actually found Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi's Sidur, as it were, right? The Eretz Yisrael Nusaf that preserves his approach to what we're saying. So to bless God for past redemption is Rava. And to bless God for something present is Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi. It's actually a, a, a true machloket between the two Talmudim, between the two uh, communities, and between the two cedar room that we now have, thanks to the Geniza. Um, okay, there were a couple of hands, so let's take a couple of, of comments. People had something to say. Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, it, it's a little off topic, but it's sort of interesting that in the Misa Eretro on, on box two, on the box, second box on page three, that in the Eretro version, they put what, what's our end of the Amina back at the beginning. Uh, good. So this is what Annie was saying, actually. If you're in box two on page three, we start off, the quote from Psalms, um, and in Eretz Yisrael, they say that quote from Psalms, but then they say, which is how we, Babel people, end um, the Amida, although it's really only one opinion of how you end the Amida. Um, now, I never thought about it, actually, until Andy pointed out, it, it, it is nice that it ends with Gaal, so you actually are going from Goel into the Amida, even though probably Smichat Geulah 
meant when they said that they meant the bracha of Gula. So here they're sort of maybe getting around, but not necessarily. So I take that as as, as a very interesting uh, point. But it's interesting that you know I always think when you say um, may the may the expressions of my mouth and the thoughts of my heart be acceptable to you, Hashem, my rock and my redeemer. I always liked that as sort of an ending and never thought about it as the beginning. Right? It's sort of this is my coda. I'm you know sort of wrap it all up in a neat bow and I'm sending this off to heaven. Um, and you know may it be acceptable to you. But there's something to be said about putting that in the beginning. Right? I'm about to I'm about to express the expressions of my heart. And I want that to be acceptable to you before I say that. Yeah. I also think there's so much that should be said at the beginning because I thought that Mishpach is saying, like, let everything pour out of me. And Yehuda said in Mishpah, he's like, I gotta be a little careful here, right? So that's like the, the well is drying up a little at the end of the Amida. We're done talking now. It's really weird to put that at the beginning. Wait, and why, why is it the well is dried up? Because it's like, oh, well, maybe what I'm saying isn't exactly what you want. Like, it's not this automatic thing that you open my lips and my mouth pours out your praise. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Right? So it's, it's, more, it's more cautionary. It's less automatic. It's more, like what you're saying is more crafted. It seems like that's what you take at the end of the scripted liturgy when you're going into the rest of your life. Uh-huh. Okay, interesting. So you're on the Bavel side of things. Just, just to point out that you're not alone, um, we have... Uh, on page two, text number nine. Unfortunately, doesn't give doesn't give any, a, a reason why. Page two, text number nine. Why don't you just read it, Annie? Uh, Rabbi Yochanan said. Rabbi Yochanan said at the beginning he said, "God opened my mouth," and at the end he said, "May the words of my mouth be acceptable." Okay, so we have Rabbi Yochanan. It's actually Rabbi Yochanan's uh, opinion um, of how you actually begin and end the Amidah. The problem is, where's Rabbi Yochanan living? Eretz Yisrael. Oh, so we have, you know, it's not necessarily clear about what's going on here. And this also gets to the problem of dividing things into strict geographical nuschaot. For instance, what's the nusach of New York? You know, right? There's variety, okay? So, so, right, right, right. No, but, not, but in New York, people are saying everything. So, uh, okay. Um, okay, wait, but you, you were going to say, yeah, bye. Right. Well, in some ways, the word ratzon, I think, is the key to unlocking that. Ratzon is a cultic word, right? Ritzay Adonai Eloheinu b'yam chayisrael u'bi tefilatam v'ashev et avodah. Ritzay is what does God want? God, we want God to accept our our sacrifices. It's a sacrifice word. It says in Vayikra. So it's possible that you're setting up this whole idea of equating the amida with the sacrifice by saying at the beginning, this is my this is my sacrifice, and I want it to be liratzon. I want it to be accepted by you. Um, and maybe not necessarily, you know, doesn't necessarily belong at the end. You were going to say, Avi. Um, yeah, I think that it does seem that this is like knowing the suffering and every time there is a new Ratzon, it feels like the idea of knowing the Ratzon to stand. So, like, right, like that's a really beautiful idea that we just stand up and pour our thoughts to God. But you're right, that like God is Hashem, right? And you have to have a sense of like, I don't just like send out, like, it makes me think of when in Hemingway, like, Uh huh. Uh huh. Good. Beautiful. Okay. Um, we only have a few minutes left, so I just want to do two other things, and then we can talk about things at the end. Um, uh, I just wanted to, to point this out because it's strange. Um, how many blessings are there in the Amida? Oh man, this is terrible. What's the name of the Amida? Oh God, right? So this is like it's you know okay. Bring it on. I'm ready to learn about Judaism. Okay. Basic prayer number one. It's the, it's the blessing is called, we call it 18. There are really 19 blessings. Anyways, it gets less complicated from there. Um, so here's the thing. How many, how many blessings are there? Oh, oh, to ask another way, what was that 19th blessing? Lama Shinim. How do you know, what is Lama Shinim? The heretic. Right, the blessing of the heretic. Birkat Aminim, the curse against the heretic. Right? It's, it's, uh, you know, it's a euphemism. So the heretics were cursed in number 19. This is the story of uh, Rabbi Gamliel saying, uh, you know, write the Amida, this 
character in Jewish history only appears once, Shimon Apakuli spits out the Amida, according to the Gemara. And then Ramagama says, is there anybody here who could, who could do Birkat Aminim? Is there anybody here who could, uh, uh, and it's a censored text in the Amida, but basically who could curse the, the Minim? We'll get to who the Minim are in one second. Um, and who's, who takes care of that for us? Your, your backup liturgy writer, Shmuel Akatan. Shmuel Akatan gets up on his legs and says, basically, some version of Birkat Aminim. That is the surface reading, but it's not the full story. Again, another shear. But the bottom line there is the Bavli would have us think that the 19th blessing is um, the curse against the heretic. What is the difference between the Eretz Yisrael and the Babel uh, number of, bl- of brachot here? How many do we have total? 18. 18 in Eretz Yisrael. So what's the one that must be missing? Oh, no, right? So at least I knew this much, right? I knew. Okay, fine. It's called 18, but there's a 19th blessing. So I finally found the original version of the Amida with the 18. I know exactly which one is going to be missing. Nope. No. And the reason, and so just turn over to page 6. This is the general theme of the Amida is more complicated than we give it credit for. Um, if you turn over to page 6, you see um, that uh, you have an Eretz Yisrael um, in, in what's in box number 14 on page 6, uh, a blank, uh, you know, for the Etzemach, which is apparently the extra one in Babel. But in the one in 14 Eretz Yisrael, you have this interesting ending, which is, and again, most of the endings of the Brachot are exactly the same, but here you have Baruch Atah Hashem, Elohei David Bonei Yerushalayim, or in many texts from the Geniza, it's Elohei David Ubonei Yerushalayim. At any time you have a um, chatima that has a conjunction in it, you start to you have to start to be suspicious. Elohei David Ubonei Yerushalayim. Well, give me another example of a of a conjunction bracha. Ah, okay. Shover, Oyvim, U, Machmiyah, Seidim. So, you know, who just, you know, who breaks the enemies and, and causes those who sin uh, on purpose to submit. Um, Elohim, Sori Yisrael, Begala. Sori Yisrael, Begala. Okay, interesting. Um, Sori Yisrael, Begala. Uh, although it's not necessarily a verb, but you know something is you know maybe going on there. Other thought, yeah. Because oh, Israel Azikaron, right? Okay. So there's two objects. They're supposed to two verbs. Right. Okay. Good. Mishan. This is another verb. Mishan umivta latzadikim. Right. Again, common for another shear. But here we have, there's a principle, general principle in liturgy of Ein Chot Min Bishtayim. You don't have two, whatever that means, two verbs, two subjects at the end of a, of a bracha. Here we seem to have some. Right? So one possibility is, Bavel says, wait a minute, Elohei David Uvonei Yerushalayim, I want to divide that into two. Okay? One possibility. Or, Eretz Yisrael says, why is there a separate blessing for David building Jerusalem? That's not a construction project. That's the Messiah, right? And then you have a similar one of Matzmiach Karim Yeshua. You have salvation. Why do I need two brachot about, about the sort of salvation, the future time? I'll jam it into one. So you don't know which way, the, if it's expanding or contracting, but fundamentally you, have, uh, you start to notice that if you were looking for themes in the Amida and you wanted to start cutting things, um, you might say, why do I need etzemach as a different bracha from the Yerushalayim? Um, okay, just uh, um, one and a half final things. Um, so I'm going to hold, hold comments. This is a, a week for the folks who are here from college about um, differences in and out, you know, Jews and non-Jews, etc. So if you just take a look at the, um, at the blessing slash curse against the heretics, which are on page five, box number 12. This is just interesting to note. We start in, in, in Ashkenaz, page 5, box number 12. Uh, we start in Ashkenaz, Vila Malshinim. We start a, a, you know, a, a sentence with Vila Malshinim, to the slanderers, al tigva. There should be no hope. Now, your sixth grade teacher would say, you can't start a sentence with the word and, right? And then you read the New Yorker, right? And the whole thing's thrown off. 
But fundamentally, <laughs> the rule seems to be you don't want to start a, 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 you know, a paragraph with a conjunction. <laughs> okay? Um, and indeed, it, it should raise some liturgical flags for you, which is to say, wait, if there was a conjunction, something might have preceded it. Now we see in the left-hand side um, what that is. La mishumadim al titikba. And in many texts you have la mishumadim vila malshinim. For the apostates, for those who converted out of Judaism, vila malshinim, and to the slanderers, the ones who turned Jews into the government, al titikba. Should there, there should be no hope. Now the thing is, if you're a mishumad, if you're someone who converts out of Judaism in pre-modern times, what's the number one thing you're going to do? You walk straight up to the priest, you give them a copy of the Sidur, and you say, here are the things in which those Jews are talking to you, and they're not saying very nice things. And that's when the censorship begins. Right? It's not that these guys who were censors were you know, experts in Jewish liturgy. It's that the people who were experts in Jewish liturgy, i.e. anybody who had access to Jewish liturgy, when they would convert out, would turn them in, and then the censors started to censor things out. So the word mishumad got censored out. Um, and you see also in the text from uh, Eretz Yisrael, the Hanotrim, the Haminim Kirega Yovedi. They start naming names here, right? <laughs> Hanotrim the Haminim. So the mean, a mean seems to be, this is also a matter of scholarly debate, but a mean originally seems to be a Jewish Christian. That is to say, not a pagan who converted to Christianity, but a Jewish Christian, okay? Um, that was a mean, um, which is probably synonymous with La Um And Hanotrim is, you know, it's a modern word for Christian, but there's a whole debate about what that means, and if it was a particular person from Nazareth, right, Nazareth, Notrim, or something else, some 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 group of people is 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 being cursed here, as opposed to in the in the sort of the version that we have, which is bechol harisha, all evil, <coughs> right? We're not naming names anymore. Okay, the Lamashim sneaks in, but you know what? Nobody likes a tattletale, right? So I can handle that. Bechol harisha and all the evil keregatovei. Um, so you just notice that, that the ways in which um, the Eretz Yisrael Nusach was naming names about people that they were cursing against, and fundamentally, um, the, the Babel text doesn't. Why? Again, big question mark. Was it because the Christians were more of a threat in Eretz Yisrael than Babel? Maybe. Maybe the censors got to the stuff in Babel before they got to the stuff in Eretz Yisrael. Who knows? We just, we just bottom line don't know. But it's interesting to note the differences there. And if you have a problem with this bracha, it could have been a lot worse. Okay. Now, um, moving on to the, the last point here. Um, since I wasted all the paper on it, I'll show you the very last two pages, is an actual text from the Genitra. That is to say, it's a manuscript. Manuscript means something that was written by hand, so it doesn't cut the font. You know, Times New Roman is not as clear here. Um, but you see on the bottom of page 11, the good thing about reading manuscripts from the liturgy is that if you know the liturgy to some extent, you can start to follow the manuscript. So this, on page 11, at the very bottom, you take a look at the last line. The second word in, bifi. Okay, you see right after that little break, the last line on page 11. Bifi yisharim titromam, uvdirei tzadikim tit, ah, I can't quite read it. Uvil shon, flip over the page. Hasidim tit kodash, uvikerev kedoshim tit halal. All right, we recognize that, and you can keep writing. Bimakalod, rivabot, and you can see all the differences that is between this particular text of the Geniza and our version of Shabbat morning. What's the one thing to note is just sort of ob obvious about what's going on here versus what we say on Shabbat morning. This is our, our the Ashkenazi high holiday version, although Sfard says this all the time. Um, but, but fundamentally, you see this, sh this showed up in Eretz Yisrael. The, the verbs are moved around. Um, correct. This is the modern day Sfard says this every day, and Ashkenaz says it only on high holidays. Um, but you can take this and practice your reading of the uh, of the of the manuscript here um, on your subway ride home. Um, the the I just want to sort of end with that question that I started with about what happened to all those manuscripts um, that were sent off to all those libraries in Europe. And to just take a look at this, you'll take a look at page eight, um, which we're not going to read in detail. But when you're pressed for time on your next mincha, you can take a look at page eight. And daven this even shorter Amida, um, which is basically one of the major contributions of the Geniza was thousands and thousands of poems that were liturgical poems, piutim. Piut is a poem in, in, uh, in Greek, basically, Hebrew, um, that replaced the standard liturgy. 
So we have piyutim in our davening now that are in addition to the standard liturgy, like Zochreinu Lechayim, we say on our holidays, or El Adon, or El Baruch during the weekdays, um, these alphabetical piyutim. But here, they weren't adding them, they were replacing them. Okay, so you can see here on page 8, Te'ameitz Cheleinu, Eloa Magineinu, Baruch Atah Hashem Magen Abraham. We're dispensing with the whole theme in four words, and then you go straight to the Chatima. And you move on through, and everything's got four or five words to the poem. I, I didn't finish typing the whole thing, but it's, it's a manuscript that was found, a poetic rewriting of the Amida. Again, this was not um, creative liturgy class for some, you know, kooky, uh, you know, project after school. This was said in shul as a way of saying the Amida and, and, getting, uh, and getting your obligation for uh, the time of you for Mincha, for Mincha done. Now, what's amazing about that is this was found in a manuscript um, that was originally in the Cairo Geniza. And as I said, these manuscripts moved all over the libraries of Europe. Well, um, this was published in a book uh, that came out in 1949. 1949, uh, in a, a small group of scholars got together and tried to assess the damage of the manuscript uh, collections after World War II. And they tell this story. It's an amazing, it's an amazing text, which I, I unfortunately forgot to bring, but it's an amazing text where they basically report in very dry terms the, the following plan, which is that in Hungary, um, the Nazis had a plan to collect all of the Jewish manuscripts and put them into one institute for Jewish manuscripts, the plan of which was to then destroy them. So in other words, in, with German efficiency, they didn't want to just, you know, go to every house and rip up the books and burn them. They wanted to collect all the manuscripts first and then destroy the whole, whole house together, making sure they exactly. destroyed all trace of, of the manuscript tradition. And the, uh, the scholars report that the Allied bombing began in Hungary before they were able to complete the project. And so the Allies bombed, um, bombed the city where this institute was, destroying the house, basically doing the work of the Nazis for them, except for a basement that was survived the bombing um, and produced uh, the volume that was published in 1949, including this text of the Amida, which otherwise would have been completely lost to history. So what you have is uh, the history of the Cairo Geniza is you have somebody in the Jewish historical ether in Eretz Yisrael writing some prayers, flows down to Egypt, ends up in old Cairo, gets discovered by these Scottish women with their fancy white gloves, brings it to Salman Schechter. Salman Schechter rescues all these uh, these texts, but not all of them, and they get scattered across the libraries of Europe. World War II happens. These manuscripts, which have survived hundreds and hundreds of years, get destroyed, not by the Nazis who tried to destroy them, but by the bombing of the Allies. And only a small amount of those manuscripts main, remain, and we have it here to read today <coughs> in, you know, in front of us, which I think is just an amazing parallel to the way in which the Jewish people sort of moved along with the manuscripts. The manuscripts also follow the Jewish people. Um, so I invite you to, uh, to go further into the idea of what the Cairo Geniza has offered us, what, the, what Jewish liturgy, um, and how it can change as a result of seeing some variants. Um, and uh, I hope you enjoy your next Amida. I should, I should say this is the Taste of Yeshivat Adar. If anybody's interested in our getting paid to learn, you get a stipend, and it's free. Summer program, year-round program, part-time classes. I'm happy to talk about it, as are any of the fellows who are here. Thank you. Yeah, yeah.